Welcome to another exciting and elucidating episode of the OmniTalk Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Ann Mazinga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are the founders of OmniTalk, the fast-growing retail blog that is all about the companies, the technologies, and the people that are coming together to shape the future of retail, or as we like to say, the blog that focuses on tomorrow's companies and tomorrow's trends today. Chris. And today we are going to talk about something that sounds both entertaining and is also very, yes, inter- it does. very important for retailers and brands that are listening to be thinking about. And that is, what is that Ann? account takeover or ATO? Ooh, Isn't, I don't know anything about this. I know this it's going to be fun. Subject. And I feel like that after listening to so many eighties, like genre music tracks over the course of the last weekend, Ugh. I feel like this, this topic needs its own, like the account takeover. Oh my like, God. Wow. Like you're going to the training montage. Yes, it does. <laughs> the Kenny does. Loggins song. I, exactly. Exactly. And, and you were already getting a taste, but to join us for this conversation, only one person can flow with us 100%. and understand us with this. And that is Signified's Chief Marketing Officer, Indy Guha. Indy, welcome back to the show. We're really excited, if you can't tell, to have you on, on the show today. Thank, thanks for having me back. Uh, Chris informs me I'm a third timer. Um, yes, so yes you are. The Jersey retirement party around the corner. Uh, I'll come up with a Jersey number so that you guys can retire it at some point. Okay. Yeah, it's awesome. No, we, it's for those that are listening the first time, we always love having Indy on the show. This is his third time on the show because he always enlightens us about a topic. And today, and you mentioned it account takeover. I wanted you to sing it. Yeah. Yes. You want I can't sing it. And <laughs> okay. for everyone listening, I spare them that, that pain and suffering. Uh, but no, it's, it sounds, it's, I'm, I'm getting a taste of it from Indy and, and, and what you've learned so far. And it sounds really fascinating, but before we get to that, Indy, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and, and Signify, too, to start us off? Yeah, happy to. Um, so my background, uh, Indy Guha, I lead marketing, product partnerships, and other things at Signified. Prior to that, led e-commerce technology investments at Bain Capital Ventures, um, where through our ecosystem in, in Bain Capital-backed retailers, I heard firsthand about a lot of the growth challenges as people made the shift to digital. And that would often inform where we would invest, uh, including how I came to meet Signified itself um, through jet.com, if you remember those folks being a client of Signified in the early days. Um, So that's how I came to be here. Uh, In terms of a quick nutshell on Signified, the easiest way to think about us is we are in the checkout flows of Walmart, eBay, Samsung, Albertsons on down we see a huge proportion of shoppers every day, every week. And we use that network of data, that prior knowledge of shopper identity and intent to drive higher conversion rates. So better decisioning through the payments layer, fully automated order flows. That tends to help a lot with omni-channel and expedited fulfillment. It's a big unlock for all of that while eliminating fraud and abuse. Obviously today we're gonna be focused on that third pillar because it helps unlock the other two. Yes, that this is like one of the one of the many reasons we love having you on, Indy. And uh, in addition to his mellifluous voice. In addition to yes. your mellifluous voice. I always have to call that out. You definitely do every always. time. Poor <laughs> every time he's on here he has to hear it. Um, yeah. But but we, without a doubt, you are the experts in some of the most fiendish and intriguing concepts that we get to cover ever on our show. And as you mentioned earlier, one of those topics that we're going to discuss today is account takeover. So can you explain for the listeners what it is and why retailers need to have a strategy for stopping it? And if you want to sing it, you can do that too. Yeah, I I don't have an ATO rap. Uh, (laughs) Yet, yet. Yeah, right. We still have have the whole show. And you call yourself a marketer. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Uh, So... Uh, it, it, it's a great question, Anne, and I think we should take a step back and talk about why the surface area for accounts is growing, why the importance of accounts is growing. And I think it's a reality, all of your listeners, uh, we as an ecosystem have been living for a while. Right. Customer acquisition costs continue to climb for any number of reasons, right? Three companies control 70% of internet ad dollars. Um, the thing people have been talking about for 20 years of 
linear TV ad budgets finally moving to digital actually happened in the last three years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of root causes, but the end result is the same. Customer acquisition costs have skyrocketed. I think Axios in their last article on the subject estimated that jump to be about 50%. Mm. Uh, obviously CAC goes up, return on ad spend goes down. And you know, retailers only really have two big levers to break out of that squeeze, right? One, the topic we'll say for another day is really leaning on your payment stack for higher conversion rates and making sure that when somebody comes to your site, you're not turning away 10% of your transaction volume, which right. is the industry average. And that's right. Visa's data, not mine. Right. The other big path is loyalty, right? And fundamentally, CRM and loyalty requires an account entity. It's the reason Amazon Prime exists. Right. Mm -hmm. And for every other retailer, in this world of rising user acquisition costs, that is the play. How do I create a compelling event for my shopper to authenticate themselves when they're shopping on my digital properties, whether it's my website, my mobile app, whatever. And that can be some combination of, you know, loyalty points, exclusive coupons, all the things right. we do as an industry to drive loyalty right. and share of wallet. But now it's authenticated and there's a stored card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to basically make that checkout flow, that purchase experience, that much more seamless. Now, the problem is you're, as an industry, going from, let's call it less than 10% of traffic is has an account that they sign into to hopefully more than 50%. That's great from the marketing objective from CRM, right? Customer relationship management. Terrible for a storing personally identifiable information and protecting that information perspective. Because you have this sea change moment happening where the average retailer hasn't had to protect digital PII before and now does. Right. So what so so where's the opportunity there for 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 the fraudster? I mean that's why I always love having you on the show because you open our eyes to that. So like where is the where's the opportunity there? How are the I mean it, you can see you get get a sense of of what we're talking about here in terms of the scale, but how are they actually exploiting the opportunity? Yeah, it, uh, it's a fascinating but unfortunate question. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we are talking about identity theft, right? It's just right. happening. It's not happening on bank accounts anymore. It's happening on your retailer's loyalty program app. Um, so how does this go down? Um, first, let's talk about what, we talked about why the surface area for accounts is increasing. Mm -hmm. Why does the fraudster care? A bunch of reasons. Okay. In general, think of fraud pressure as squeezing a balloon. If you clamp down on fraud at one point in the shopper journey, you just push the air to other points in the journey, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, it's a great analogy. Because the underlying products have value. They have an aftermarket. If I can get my hands on them, I can turn around and sell them. Mm -hmm. So because of the success of technologies like the Signified, fraud pressure at checkout is much more easily deflected. Fraudsters have had to adapt, right? They are, this is organized crime. Right. Their They're business, business model people. is to, yeah, right. yeah. so they Smart have to business people. growth vectors. Right. The account is the growth vector. And, and what makes it attractive? Well, for starters, the you, you immediately get control of currency, right? Payment information. And usually when there's a data breach and people steal credit cards, they actually have to take the test, the step of testing the card to see if it's good. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you heard the term card testing. That is an organized crime syndicate cycling thousands of cards that they got off the Dropbox breach or pick your most recent breach right. to make sure which ones they can use. If you steal a, a card, uh, an account that's tied to a retailer, you know the card is good. Right. Mm. And all of the other um, sort of social engineering people do to impersonate an identity, shipping address, date of birth, email address, phone number, it's all in there. Right. So that also makes it a really attractive target for a fraudster. 
from a consumer behavior perspective, maybe this will hopefully help folks listening to the podcast. We are all guilty of reusing login info, right? So Google surveys, 65% of people reuse passwords, right? Which makes sense. Uh, I think Virginia Tech did a study where they thought, or they found the average consumer has 150 online accounts. And that was a couple of years ago. It's only increased since then, right? For the reasons we talked about. Yep. So if you put this together, if I as a fraudster can penetrate, they can take over an account, I get fully validated information and it's an easy mark. I think the, the last piece of this is most retailers are not set up to block a transaction if it's coming through a known account and the user is signed in. So if I can get into the account, I can bypass a bunch of other risk management that's downstream. So you're saying, Indy, like in that situation, say I'm logged into my, I want to get points for my target purchase in the same way that I would, you know, I'm logged into my account. I hit order. I'm going to curbside pickup. There's no barrier where there might be if I was just coming in out from outside, not logged in. And I wanted to do that curbside pickup, like the example that you gave, I think the last time you were on, on the show, am I thinking about that? correctly? Yeah. Or maybe okay. a, a different variation of this would be um, if you have loyalty points in your yeah. account, you, oh, I mean, wow. you can instantly redeem those by hijacking the account and the retailer is not going to question that transaction because it's coming from within a logged in session, okay. right? It, it's, it's currency like, and uh, from a fraudster's perspective, if they can figure out how to penetrate enough accounts, they will find a loyalty point jackpot. Got it. So yeah, I got it. So basically, so to end what you're saying, what India, if I'm hearing you too, is like saying, you know, traditionally you've got credit card fraud where mm -hmm. somebody will get a hold of somebody's credit card. They'll go in, probably check out as guest mm -hmm. is probably the right nomenclature for that. Right. And, mm -hmm. and then it's up to the retailer to figure out that that transaction is, is real or fraudulent, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that case, fraudulent. But here you're saying they're taking over the account and they could take it as far as, you know, using the credit card that's associated or attached to that account because they're signed in, or they could even go as far as uh, redeeming loyalty points or some other benefit to them. That's, that's essentially what account takeover is here. Yes. And I, I appreciate you translating industry nerd speak. I probably skipped <laughs> a few steps uh, in unpacking that. No, oh, that's okay. That's why we do what we do. And, 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 you're, and you're preaching to the uneducated here too, right. which is also an important aspect of this so, conversation. Indy, I have a, I have a random question because I just okay. did this. But so is that why we're seeing some retailers, like especially I, I'm thinking of like airline miles programs and things like that. Is that why we're you see like an extra charge being run through a credit card? Is that like an option where like, if you say you book a, a, an airline ticket and you're using all your miles, they still charge you a processing fee or something of $15 or something where you have to pay with mm. a credit card in order for that transaction to go through. I mean, is that something that retailers could, uh, is that approach they could take? Or, I mean, what, what is the, what do retailers or, or brands in that case, what do they do? Yeah, it, it, it's a fascinating question. Uh, I would say, it's really hard to assume best intentions of the airline industry. Um, so <laughs> Fair. I mean, I, as that, I was saying uh, that, I agree with you. Way to, like, uh, or do they just want the extra cut, which is probably, there's probably the some extra padding there. But that isn't, it, you know, surcharge. It, it, it wouldn't actually address the issue. And then I'll tell you why. Chances are that account has a stored credit card in it. Yep. So even if you're redeeming loyalty points, you can use the stored credit card. Right. to bypass the credit verification step. Right. And you know, that's part of why the ecosystem is looking to, and we'll come back to this later in the conversation, a more holistic approach to how you fight this problem, right? right. Uh, in the checkout step, a solution like the Signified looks at 150 different unique data elements to verify if the person transacting is who they say they are. We should be doing the same thing in the account layer versus having kind of a, piecemeal solution to how you protect the shopper journey. Okay. Um, because you can use the stored credit card, but it's, for example, very blunt example, much harder to simulate Anne's cell phone. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a device ID we can sniff out. Um, there's some geolocation tags we could access Got it. That, to understand if it's actually Anne driving the transaction. And if, is she in her normal heat map of locations when she's doing it? Right. So in, so in, so it's one thing to it's one thing to talk about this right broadly like as a concept and you know sometimes what we try to do and what we try to we, we try to uh, you know try to avoid doing too is try to put the fear of God into everyone as well or overhype things you know as much as I'm pr- I'm prone to ranting and I get crazy <laughs> for that but but you know in reality we try to keep it on the level and I think and be pragmatic as possible like how how prevalent is this now? So you've said like you can understand the root of the cause of it or why, yeah. why the fraudsters are paying attention to it, but, but how prevalent is it? How quick is it happening? Yeah, I, I, I love that you're asking this question, Chris, because nobody in retail needs more sky is falling. Uh, <laughs> right. Framing, right. There's enough things to worry about. Um, I would say this one is worth asking hard questions internally for a few reasons, right? Uh, it is the fastest growing type of attack vector for the right. reasons we talked about. Um, you have this intersection of huge surface area, low sophistication level, right? So 79% increase in ATO since 2017. And uh, I think other researchers like Imperva put out a stat that about a third of all login attempts in 2021 were malicious. Mm-hmm. So wow. it, it's, it's meaningful. Yeah. You know, ultimately let's put it, let's put aside the fear mongering. I think there's a good customer experience reason to look at this, which is, I mean, let's just boil it down to simple customer relationship management, right? The folks who are going to opt in, to having a signed in experience with the retailer definitionally are your highest value customers, right? The highest brand affinity, yeah. you know, the highest purchase frequency, which is why they're willing to set up an account. So against that context, it's a disproportionate share of your revenue that's at risk. If the account gets taken over, if loyalty points get redeemed, and then you have to have that horrible conversation between your contact center agents and your most loyal customers about how their points are gone Mm -hmm. and their loyalty, that the thing that was literally a measure of value for their loyalty, that value is gone. Yeah. And I imagine too, the other side of that is this is also the segment of customers that you're going to want to make sure that you don't make a mistake with, i.e. walk that tightrope and put the fraud detection on or fraud prevention on too much, right? Because you don't want to disappoint them because they're always coming back to you. And so that's got to be a fine balance for them to walk, right? Absolutely. You know, uh, as I'm talking, the more security-minded folks in your audience might be thinking like, oh, we can solve this with two-factor authentication, like a text message verification, and so on and so forth. You could. I think the... That that adds friction to the shopper journey, right? Mm -hmm. Um... And generally speaking, people try to do all of that step up verification really to oversimplify two points, right? One is at the account setup, and then the other is when someone tries to transact through the account. On the account setup piece, that's hard because you are trying to shift consumer behavior to drive account creation. Adding a lot of steps to the sign up flow is kind of the opposite of that, right? Right. Um, so there's a chicken and egg problem there. The step up verification, if someone's trying to transact through the account, I think that's easier to pull off, but even then, you know, there's a reason, uh, let's just, the most widely used step up verification approach is 3d secure. If you've ever gotten a text message right before you're trying to transact, that's, Mm -hmm. that's 3ds. It does lead to a huge amount of card abandonment. Right. So to your point, Chris, in both of these variations, the account creation step and the transaction step, if you can lean on prior knowledge of identity and intent of the shopper to cut down the number of step ups, hmm. you can drive more account creation and more sort of seamless shopping and loyalty without having to go overboard in attempting to protect the right. account. 
you know, it's so funny, Indy. This reminds me of this um, this meme I saw on Instagram. <laughs> I know, it's a little slightly right. off topic, yeah, but, no, go. but there was somebody that posted something like we used to have to get up, get into our cars and drive to a store to get something. And now the amount of frustration that you feel when you're trying to buy something on your phone and you have right. to go get your credit card to get the last, the three digits on the back number. of the number. Right. But I think right. it, it's, it's, it's going towards what you're saying, Indy, like you, I am your most loyal customer. I've given you all of my information. I've stored a card. I'm doing, I'm doing all these things so that I can make that as simple and slick a purchase as possible. And you're right. Like, I think the solution that you're talking about for retailers to provide that, you know, finding my phone to confirm and type in a number, like even as easy as some of the devices have made it, it's Has still it a friction point. Yep. And, and I have abandoned things in certain times. hundred percent. So Indy, what, what do you recommend then that retailers do to protect yourself themselves? You mentioned that they're doing the text authentication or some other methods, but like, what advice do you have for them as they're trying to think about how to approach this, especially when it's impacting a third of transactions? That's significant. Yeah. Um, I think broadly there, I would say there's two design objectives we as an ecosystem could embrace. Mm -hmm. One is to approach uh, this trade-off of risk and reward, right? protect the account, but facilitate loyalty, lifetime value. Approach that holistically through the shopper journey versus kind of playing whack-a-mole uh, up and down the shopper journey with point solutions and point fixes, right? And I'll explain more of what I mean by that, but mm -hmm. big idea, yeah, treat the shopper true. journey holistically and think about identifying risk and reward as a continuum, not as point solutions. Okay. Then I think the second um, basic idea would be lean on network data because it's really hard for an individual retailer to have the scale of data to know which identities have been compromised, which identities are good. Is the person trying to create an account on my site actually who they say they are, et cetera, et cetera. So to come back to the first point, it's going to be tempting for retailers to let's go back to that balloon analogy, right? Yeah. Uh, if I, if I clamp down on fraud pressure on risk in one point in the shopper journey, it's going to move upstream and downstream. If I solve checkout fraud, it'll show up in the account layer. It'll show up in the returns layer. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a retailer, if you take a piecemeal approach to the problem, you're going to end up with multiple solutions, complex stack, all of the program management overhead that comes with that. But more than the administrative hassle, it just creates blind spots, right? Because uh, let's, let's sort of describe a scenario. You could have one solution decline a transaction at checkout because they know the identity is compromised, while another solution is allowing the account to be hijacked at the same time. And then the, the next transaction attempt gets through, right? right. So you right. sort of undermine your own system because those silos aren't talking to each other. If you have a point solution protecting the account layer and a point solution protecting checkout, those are not communicating. So finding a platform approach, a single throat to choke that can go from the account layer through to the returns layer is going to be really helpful to the retailer because the adversary is the same. And now you can take a holistic approach versus creating more data silos. The second piece, the network data, it, that one's probably just easier to put a pin on. It's, right. it, you know, if a, if a retailer is trying to make an account creation or transaction decision on a first time shopper on their right. site, they're effectively flying blind. <laughs> um, and I, 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 it's, it's certainly not meant to be a joke. It's a difficult. No, it's, we've topic. talked about it before. Um, I've done this show talking about this very thing. Yeah, hundred percent. Then you know, as a point of comparison, because we're seeing Walmart's data, eBay's data, etc., for ninety-eight percent plus of U.S. households, we've seen multiple members of the household before. So why not use that type of syndicated view of your shopper base? to jumpstart that process. 
And explain to the audience then what, what does that enable you to do when you talk about account takeover then? So like, how are you using that data to key in on, Hey, this account's been taken over. What are some of the clues that you're seeing that you are able to key in on for the retailers to say, Hey, Hey, you got to watch out for this one. Yeah. Um, we, we touched on one really basic example earlier in response to Anne's question, you know, you could take over the account, um, and, access the stored credit card information, the stored shipping information, but the device ID doesn't match. Device and you've seen okay. all the device IDs that relate to Ann's household, right? So okay. we- Throughout the whole network, again, through Walmart, right. eBay transactions, everyone else that's in your network, right? That's a key point, okay. Right, so this doesn't look right. Maybe we shouldn't allow this loyalty point redemption to happen because something here isn't lining up. Right. So I think that would be an example of using network data and a lot of different data points to protect the account layer. And Indy, what's happening from the customer's perspective again? Because I, I remember when we were talking about this long ago about, you know, you get you get an email from the Nike store that's like the transaction did not go through. Is it like what's the what happens when I'm redeeming my loyalty points and and somebody with Signified's platform? has to, you know, they, they get flagged and it doesn't work. Yeah. So typically we map that escalation to whatever the retailer's existing workflows are through their contact center. Right. So in, in that example, if the point redemption transaction doesn't map, the retailer could trigger an automated email to the account holder. And just because someone's stolen your account on a retail website doesn't mean they've stolen your email. Right. So right. you and would still get an email saying, "Hey, did you attempt this transaction, et cetera, et cetera?" Right. But um, maintaining right. the relationship, then I, you're you're having visibility with the customer of exactly what's going on, why this transaction didn't go through, and I would imagine triggered automatically or or very quickly after right. that transaction is happening. Yeah, asking to update right. your login information or create more points of connection with that retailer. Mm -hmm. Okay, more authentication. Mm -hmm. And maybe let's let's turn this into a, a, a positive example, because, yeah. again, I do think all of this sits at the let's not forget why accounts are being created. Right. It's about CRM. It's about loyalty. You know, one of the things that's really interesting when you log into your Amazon Prime account is everyone you've ever sent a gift to that history lives in your shipping addresses uh, within Amazon. Right. Right. Now, the challenge for another retailer building out an account layer is out of the box, they don't have that graph of everyone you've ever sent a gift to. So a really blunt account takeover protection logic would say, anytime Chris adds a new shipping address, deny the transaction, verify the order, right? Now I'm gonna assume there's north of 50 people in the world Chris likes sending gifts to, that's too that, many. It's too many. <laughs> Less than five. Five still proves your point, Indy, yeah. for those that know me well. <laughs> nice. Well, for, like, for an individual retailer to build that history of those five people would take a while, and Chris right. would have to deal with a lot of pain in adding each of those shipping addresses, yeah. et cetera. And that's uh, happened to me, actually, honestly. Yeah. Whereas we've seen Chris's graph across our retail network. And so having a, a technology like a Signify in the account layer, you wouldn't need to add that friction when Chris wants to use his account to send a gift. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really smart. I mean, that again, it's about removing the friction and knowing, giving the giving your customers the reward of what the you know, reward back for the information that they've given you in simple things like. I don't have to cancel that. I don't have to cancel that. Transition. Yeah, it's about the revenue capture here, right. which is always why we like having you on. I mean, the other point I think it, that it speaks to in closing, which you know is a point we've we've discussed before with you guys. It is what you said. It's the network effect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's thinking more. I think digitally for retailers in general, like you know, we've talked about you know cloud commerce. Like, how do you make things more available in the cloud in general as a retailer? Whether it's your store workflow processes, whether it's your counting processes, whether it's your fraud prevention and, de and detection processes, but also the network effects that are enabled when you think about this more broadly, when you go away from point to point, as you said, and you think about it, it's like, how do I work smarter? Because everyone else is working together. It's almost communal in a lot of ways. And 
I'll give you the last word on that, Indy. But th- th- that's how that's my big takeaway here again, which is a point that we've talked about before. But it's important to keep reiterating that that's the right approach. Yeah, I I think there are lots of special sauce capabilities retailers have in house, right? Whether that's merchandising, whether that's you know design aesthetic. There's a bunch of unique attributes right. that retailers should absolutely be best in class at in-house. On, in, on this one, the value of the network data is just so obvious that you know, building it internally, replicating it internally, there's got to be a reason why the Walmarts and Ebays of the world chose to go external. Right. How about right. we put it that way? Right, 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 um, right. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I think I said that on our Fast Five podcast a few weeks ago. It's like, name your name your process that everyone's doing the same way that the customer at the end of the day doesn't differentiate you for it makes no sense to try to do all that yourself when all the data is readily available somewhere else or you can share the workload to make it more efficient give you more economies of scale so yeah 100 percent agree with you it's so great to hear you say that um well hey man i i I love having you on the show and i know you feel the same way right like it's just you got the great voice the great knowledge you're dropping (laughs) Learned about account takeover today. Um, that's a fascinating topic. Like I'd never thought about that, that now they're going after the actual account that you own with these retailers. So if people want to learn more, get in touch with you, Indy, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so feel free to drop me a note, indy.guha at signified.com. Um, you can also learn more about some of the research we've done on you know both sort of industry best practice trends, but also fraud and abuse trends uh, on the Pulse Hub on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, so signified.com slash Pulse, where we publish kind of network-wide insights uh, across all the merchants we work with. Um, but always a pleasure to be here, uh, and Chris, and uh, would welcome questions and follow-up from your listeners. That'd be great. I'm sure you'll get it because your content's always one of the most listened to podcasts whenever we put it out there in market. So, hey, thank you so much again for those listening. It was Signified CMO Indy Guha joining us today on behalf of him and Ann and myself, as always, be careful out there.